All right. Player choice. Um, arguably one of the more important things in game design. So what is player choice essentially? Um, you're going to be seeing a lot of stuff from extra credits. They were the only people that I looked at um, when I was making this thing because I know that they have some stuff. Um, so yeah, according to one of their videos, um, choice is when a player is presented with a scenario where they could perform two or more distinct actions, but they have to pick some number of actions that is less than the total number available to them. Um, so that's... Um, so in a more general sense, um, in addition to that, um, choice specifically involves overcoming some sort of internal conflict. Um, so you're presented with multiple things that you want to um, or could do, um, and that generates conflict. Um, it is essentially at the heart of games and game design because as literally the only form of interactive media, um, choices define what a game is. Um, because like the player input interaction with and choices um, about the medium um, impacts their experience and just like how it actually plays out. Um, an important thing to keep in mind is that a player has to have some sort of grounding or information. So they have to make an informed choice. Um, if they don't recognize that there is a choice, then arguably they are not making a choice. Um, they're just kind of doing things and they happen upon a path. Those are two pretty different things. Um, there is also a distinction between choices and meaningful choices. Um, this is specifically about how the choice makes your player feel. So um, if the players feel like um, the choice they made had an impact on the progression of either the game or the plot of the game, um, then I'd argue it's a meaningful choice. These are the kinds of choices that you kind of want your players to have um, because they're more memorable, more engaging, but not every choice has to be meaningful. Um, it's also a little bit difficult to design a meaningful choice because it can depend um, on your player. So say like you have a player who's playing your game for the narrative, um, a game about like say strategy or game game choice, a choice about strategy or gameplay might not carry the same amount of weight for them. So it's a very subjective sort of thing. Um, so it's usually good to include choices that would be meaningful for different types of players, um, but that can be a little bit difficult to predict. So there are actually a couple different types of choices. Um, some of them aren't exactly choices, but they all involve decision making in some way or another. So the first one is calculations. Um, these are those things that I was talking about where they're not exactly choices because there is an objectively correct answer. Um, so like, as you can see here, um, which gun would you like? The one with the red numbers or the green numbers? They aren't green, Warframe is weird, but there is an objectively better gun here that you can pick. Um, so yeah, calculations are really just based on logic, reason. They're usually framed as like numeric ones like this, but there are also um, sort of like just common sense things. Like, you know, if there's a campfire in front of your player and you walk into it and your player catches fire, um, when you encounter a campfire again um, and you decide to avoid it, that's a calculation because there is no, um, upside to stepping into a campfire and igniting your player and character again. So yeah, logic, reason, those are calculations. Um, and now we're getting into choices. This is one form of them, the incomplete information problem, which is a riveting name, I know. Um, but basically it's where players are forced to make a choice when they don't have enough data to predict an outcome. So for example, um, the Mario mushrooms, I'm not sure if you guys know this, um, but when they spawn in from a question mark box, they move to the right. And the right is the form of progression, but it's also the direction of um, the unknown. So if you decide to chase the mushroom, um, if you catch it, um, then you will be rewarded. You'll get the extra hit thing. So you'll be able to progress farther. 
But at the same time, you may be eating yourself into danger or a pit or like a badly placed Goomba. So there is the issue of like, you want the mushroom, but at the same time, there's a lot of risk because the mushroom is leading you into places where you might not be prepared to handle it. And it might be making you do it um, at a speed that you're not prepared to handle as well. Um, so these are sort of like tests of faith is how I put it. I'm not sure if that's the best way, but the choice comes in the form of whether you're willing to accept the challenge that the game presents you with essentially. Um, are you willing to accept the risk for the chance of the reward that it's um, offering you? And then uh, we also have incomparables. These are probably the more obvious forms of choices like skill trees, the fallout perks, where the player has multiple options that they can sort of spec into with a limited resource. So they are forced to choose um, which ones they want. Because like, I mean, ideally you'd want skills in all of these, like maxed out skills on all of these, but because of the way that fallout gives you experience and a lot of these things do, um, that's impossible. Um, or you'd have to be playing the game for a ridiculously long amount of time. So it's essentially impossible. Um, an interesting thing, of, thing about incomparables is that calculations are sometimes presented as incomparables. So that can happen if there's, I don't actually know what any of these are. So this may be incorrect, but let's say this one was just objectively better. Um, I don't know, we'll say it gives you like a straight plus 50 to your damage numbers. That would be objectively better than say, I don't know, what is this? Recognizing doors <laughs> or something like that. So if it comes down to that sort of thing where there's like um, perks um, or incomparables that are arguably better, then it's not an incomparable choice, it's a calculation. And this is usually where metas come from, where there are just specific builds um, that players gravitate towards because everything else is just so, like a lot less efficient, which is actually an issue that um, World of Warcraft ran into a couple years ago. It's something that a lot of MMOs struggle with and where a lot of their like balance patches come into play because if they release something that is objectively better, um, then everybody's going to use it and all of the other thousands of perks that they have will be underutilized, which is something that they don't want. And then we also have a distinction between choices and consequences. Um, this is kind of more, uh, we'll go with a difference between like when the player realizes um, the impact of their actions. Um, choices are where the player weighs the impacts um, before or during, so when they're presented with the choice. Um, they are encouraged to consider the impacts and the outcomes, the possibilities, all of that. Whereas consequences, the player acts, and then later on they are made to realize the impact of their decisions. Um, a good example that I heard was um, Chrono Trigger. Um, I don't know if you guys have played that, that game's really old, but um, apparently during the like tutorial intro sequence, um, you can run around in this town and there are like these little mini side quests that you can do for like um, the townsfolk, they're both good and bad. Um, so you could like help this little girl look for her lost cat or steal an old man's lunch. Um, and they're kind of like just, um, they're framed at like these just random interactable things that you can do. Um, but then at the end of the game, um, your character goes on trial and all of the townsfolk that you were interacting with at the beginning of the game um, come back to testify for or against you. And depending on your actions at the beginning of the game, that will impact whether you are found guilty or innocent. So that is a good example of consequences where like in the moment you don't really think about what you're doing as the player. It's just like these fun things that you can do. And then at the end of the game, it hits you that um, those actions can come back to bite you. All right, and now we're going to be getting into a very important topic for game design specifically, which is the illusion of choice. Because, well, I didn't organize these slides very well. 
But basically the illusion of choice is when players feel like they're like they are making a meaningful choice, um, when actually that choice has little to no lasting impact on the game or the narrative or anything like that. Um, this can come in a couple forms. Um, one of the ways is that there actually is not a choice, but it feels like there is one. Um, or if the consequences are minimal to non-existent in the long run. This is kind of those um, smaller telltale um, dialogue options outside of like the big ones where you have to like branch the story. I'm surprised I didn't use more telltale examples because they are pretty good at illusions of choice. But yeah. So the illusion of choice is actually very important because um, as I'm sure a lot of you guys are realizing, it's impossible to deliver on truly limitless options. Um, you just can't, um, either because of budget, time, scope. It's just impossible to put everything that you want into your game. Um, and even if you do, there will be other things that you could put into your game that you won't be able to. But there are also other limitations that are more like I suppose logical limitations. Um, so you can't, for example, implement something that would break your physics engine or that your game engine can't support. Um, there may be something that doesn't fit into your game narratively or match the theme of your game. So like, for example, um, in a game like Stardew Valley, you wouldn't be able to like run in guns blazing because that's just not what the game is about. So that's sort of like a thematic limitation on player choice. Um, I suppose another example of like the game engine thing would be you cannot, um, you can't turn like one of the old Zelda games into a first person shooter because it's a top down 3D, like, you know, it's a top down 2D RPG. So yeah, there's just sort of these, things that prevent developers from, um, well, encourage developers to use the illusion of choice. Um, but it can also be good for the players because um, how many of you guys are familiar with the term choice paralysis or analysis paralysis? Yeah, so for those of you who aren't aware, um, it's basically where you are presented with so many options that you become overwhelmed by the sheer amount of choices that you could make. Um, so you spend all your time analyzing and deciding and you never actually make a choice. Um, so that is very bad for um, games. Um, a good example of this would be like um, old, like 90s and early 2000s character creators would used to just throw all of the information onto one screen um, and that tended to scare players away because they didn't know where to start. So provide like clamping some limits down on what the players can do can actually help them in the long run, even though, um, as we'll get to a little bit later, the illusion of choice kind of has some sort of negative connotations, we'll say, with players um, when they realize that it's happening. So that's one of the things you should do is make sure your players don't realize that you're doing this. Um, but that brings up the question, how do we do it? Um, and a good way to do that is to make the choices engaging in the moment. So they feel important even if they actually aren't. Um, so one way to do that is to make the actual decision compelling. Um, I don't know, sort of like, you'd have to pick sides in an argument between two NPCs that you really like. That would be compelling for most players if they're playing for the characters. Um, and even if it is unconsequential, like I said, it should feel important to the player. And that's just kind of hard to nail down. You would have to do that through a lot of like play testing and figuring out how your players react to it. So you can kind of fine tune um, exactly how you want that choice to land. And then another important thing is to include a payoff of some kind, acknowledge the player's choice in some way um, so that um, it feels like their choice had an impact, which is the whole point of a meaningful choice. Um, and this is one of the issues that happens when your players become aware. 
of the illusion of choice is it can make them sort of feel like they're being railroaded um, to some extent, but this is also just indicative of just bad choice implementation because um, this is actually a Dungeons and Dragons term. I don't know if, how, how many of you are familiar with it, but essentially it happens when um, sort of the dungeon master um, sets their players on a very strict path and doesn't allow any deviation from it. Um, so you're, you're stuck on the railroad tracks is where the word comes from. Um, so when your players feel like their choices are meaningless, it can make them feel like they're being railroaded, um, uh, which is definitely something that you don't want to have happen because players don't like to feel like they have no options. That's why they come to games is so that they can make choices that have lasting consequences. Well, not lasting consequences, um, but you guys know what I mean. They want to feel like they can interact with their media in a, I lost the word. We'll go with important, impactful, there we go, impactful way. Um, so that's why they play games. So feeling like they don't have any say in that, um, they may as well just be watching a movie at that point. So it's kind of defeating the whole reason why they came to games in the first place. So railroading is something that you want to avoid. Um, and sort of the way to do that, there's um, two sort of different types of illusions. They relate to two different branches of gameplay, which is the narrative and the actual gameplay. Um, so we'll go into narrative illusions first. These are sort of like um, the most obvious example I can think of this is like dialogue options, where like, you know, in like Fallout, Skyrim, those sorts of things, you'll be given different options of dialogue. And like, um, depending on what you say, it doesn't really impact how the game progresses. But in the moment, there are like different reactions to the lines that you choose. And that sort of makes it feel like your decisions have impact. Um, there is also um, this sort of beads on a string method, which kind of ties, it's, um, the phrase for what I just described. I'm not doing this in a very good order. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, in this method, the story will branch off a um, moment like temporarily, depending on choices that the player makes. So like, you know, dialogue options. Um, this is actually basically Telltale's whole game plan, where you make these branching decisions um, and then depending on the choice that you made, you have two kind of different paths and then they converge again at a like point farther on and then the story continues and it would have regardless of which choice you made. Um, so that kind of accomplishes two goals where the player feels like they had an impact on the narrative, but you don't actually have to write two completely separate narratives. You just have to write the branches and then just kind of slot them in depending on the choice the player makes, which is a lot easier to do. Um, there are some games, um, I think like The Witcher, the original Witcher kind of does this where one choice you make early on leads you to playing like completely different games. So they essentially wrote two different stories depending on this one choice that you make. That can be cool for the players to figure out but it's also extremely expensive because you're basically making two games. Um, so it is possible to do that. Um, it's also possible for your um, branches to never tie back into beads um, for say like, if you have a game with multiple endings, you wouldn't really need to tie them all back together into a main story because the story is ending. Um, and yeah, let's see. Yeah, and just kind of going back to the whole point with The Witcher, um, the longer that they diverge, um, the longer that the branches, the differing parts have to be. And so the more expensive time-wise and money-wise and like person-wise it becomes because you just have to do more work essentially. And then there are also the gameplay illusions, which I think are actually pretty neat. 
um, where you direct the players towards a specific action for them to take in the game while making them feel like they chose it. Um, so um, one example is what I refer to as nope moments, where your player is kind of going along a path that looks like it has um, diverging branches to it, but most, if not all, but one of the branches have obstacles or something that they either can't overcome or they really don't want to face. So like say, like one of your paths split, you want your care, your player to go left. So um, instead of just making the path go left, you want them to feel like they have some agency, you let them go right for a bit and then it's like, oh shoot, there's a tank there. I don't want to deal with that. So then they turn around and go left. That is a lot more engaging than just having a straight path. Um, so a good example of this, um, and like one of the things that I point out here where it's common in games with one map that the player loops through and more and more areas unlock as they gain more things is the Ori series. Um, Ori in the Blind Forest is really, really good at this. That's basically their whole game MO. So like here, um, as you can see the water's purple. Um, in the beginning of the game, all of the water is purple. And if you touch it, you instantly die. So you learn pretty quickly, don't go in the water. So it becomes a choice to avoid the water. But then after you complete a game stage, you learn how to swim and you clean out the water. And now you can go into the water levels and like half of the map, the map size basically doubles because you can now go back and the player is motivated to go back and check in all of the ponds that they were trying to jump over initially because this whole new world has opened up to them. Um, so that is one example of a game implementing that really well. And then there's also visual highlighting. Um, you guys have probably seen this where like, um, if the game, game designers want you to go somewhere, there are certain things that they can change in the environment to encourage the player to go to a certain place without the player even realizing it. So like um, highlighting things with light or spotlighting things is the most obvious example of this. I don't have a picture of that, which I'm realizing is kind of an ideal, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Like if you're in a dark hallway and there's light coming in through a slightly open door, you're gonna wanna go check out that slightly open door. Everything else kind of gets phased out um, and you don't pay as much attention to it. So this can be something you can take advantage of to sort of, I don't know about short change being the right word, but like kind of neglect, I guess, everything that's not the one thing that you're highlighting because the players aren't really going to be paying much attention to it anyways, unless they're the type that like likes to look around and try to find places where the game developers broke things and weren't paying much attention. So essentially this will this will help you like draw the attention of in the way you want of everyone except the people who you want to be beta testers. Um, so yeah, like I said, illuminated areas, um, anything that resembles a road is also a really good way to get people to go. If you just like, you know, have a section of the grass that's like slightly lower than everything else, they're more likely to follow that. Um, and it makes the world feel a lot more open and vibrant than it really is. So it allows you to kind of cut some corners a little bit, which will make your life a lot easier. And then it has the added benefit of making the players feel like they chose that they wanted to go check out that illuminated door or the path through the grass. Um, and yeah, that's basically all that I have. Um, as you can see, I like exclusively like from extra credits. They are really incredible if you're interested in this kind of stuff. They have a lot of really good like quick videos. They're like five to 10 minutes focusing on a single topic um, about game design. Um, they have a really good um, series on like narratives in games and also designing for a purpose as well. That's something that they focus on a lot. And then my boyfriend helped me out with this. He's a DM. He was the one that told me about the railroading. Um, 
So yeah, he helped me out with that. It makes it, the way you worded it, it makes it sound like you got experience with him DMing you and you were <laughs> railroading you. Oh <laughs> no, this is he's his experience. experience. You. Yeah, he's also a player in a campaign, so he has experienced railroading. <laughs> so yeah. I may want to reword that before I release the slides. <laughs> but yeah. Um my boyfriend railroads me. <laughs> okay, that sounds <laughs> 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 yep the realization all right so um i guess one thing that we could do is um can you guys think of like would you guys be interested in doing like a little interactive thing so we would, like think about certain kinds of choices you could add in a situation for a game sure. i was yeah. thinking of that bioshock example that everyone is so mad about <laughs> Where uh, at the very beginning of the game, you have to choose between like a statue of a bird and a statue of a cage. And at the very end, they're like, that doesn't matter. There's only one enemy. <laughs> Wait, what? At the very beginning of the game, you have to choose between like a bird and a cage. And it's like very like symbolic. And you have to like spend a lot of time choosing. And then they never do anything like that, ever. You never see it again. I see. Interesting. It's just there too long. You're red herring, I guess. All right. This is weird I think I'll do something kind of similar. Like, you know, I think it was like the follow through or whatever. You had to like send a companion to like uh, a radioactive area, but you couldn't send them once they're resistant to radiation to do it. You can make sacrifice someone. Isn't that uh, our team like where you heard something was like, I think Bioshock is easy. Like, you pick between two people to like save. No. I remember that being like fall asleep. Yeah, it was a new game. Well, Bioshock is not a new game either. Or like Bioshock Infinite. Like, we're like, I mean, not new, new, but like, not like Fallout 3, like old. <laughs> um, or when did Fallout 3 come out? Take a guess. Yeah, yeah, it was mad as old as she does. Wait. Not red resistant, but yes, that is what I want, right? <laughs> It's well, it is kind of loud. It's been a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Here's, a, here's an example I can think of. Um, in Mass Effect, apparently they had like a really low budget for the voice actors. So they just had them record like one line reactions to like your conversation. So regardless of what choice you made, they give the same response. <laughs> but it's it's written well enough that like you don't realize that your first playthrough until you go through again and you pick something different and it's like, wait, you said that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good example of this. Uh, I figured it out what I was thinking in the Twisted Evil 7. Oh, uh, yeah. Answer. I guess I got the bio part. Uh, you choose between saving two people. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's like I your your fiance and life. this random chick that you met, it's like right? Life saving yeah. serum, or you got like one thing of like a life saving serum or something. You can't use um, the other serum as a weapon. A life saving. Oh. Yeah. That's the question. Oh, makes it harder when one of them is your in-game wife, who you believe was dead at least twice already. And the other is a super helpful character who saved your neck multiple times, reattached your severed hand, and also developed a life saving serum that's now in your hands. Obviously, you go with the wife. Yeah. <laughs> that game hates the protagonist's hand for some reason. They do. He gets his hand cut off like four times between like two games. <laughs> Let's see, another. I'll put that as like a telltale choice. Because that is very much like a sort of thing that Telltale would do. 
when people also kind of message like you know, you're working with saying that your choices didn't matter if you're getting the game, it was just the color of the explosion, you just changed the color of the explosion. Oh yeah, yeah. Mass effect three got me so angry. Yeah, some mm -hmm. drama that they do Yeah, the drama was terrible. Well, the cap, this this chalk is like neon in that light. That's so weird. <laughs> it's glowing. <laughs> Mass Effect man is to somehow both have too much money and not enough money. Yeah, they do that because some of the original ending, and then they got they yeah, got Fallout out four. Out of it. Yeah, sure. In Fallout four, uh, I don't know if they do this other time, but uh, at the beginning of the game, when there's like the the vault salesman, uh, whichever path you choose, like even if you decline it multiple multiple times, like you. Some there's some way that like you buy the vault or whatever. Oh yeah, you know, I stuff. remember hearing about that. Yeah, like it's either like you agree to it at first, or like you don't agree to it, and then you talk you into it, and then you agree, or it's like you don't agree, and you don't agree, and then like your wife uh, is like, okay, yeah, or your husband, uh, whichever character you are. Yeah. So. Or just like looped dial. Oh yeah, dialogue looping boss. dialogue. That's that's not really game specific. I'll I'll put that over here. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just like, oh, right, you can make this choice, but then you make the choice again. It just keeps looping the same thing. Really fun about games like you choose the path, and then they let you mess it up completely. Like Dark Souls, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah Dark Souls. Like, wasn't there a game that like made you fight the final boss like the beginning, and you're supposed to lose to it, but. Oh I, yeah, yeah. but then, then people figured out how to actually beat it. <laughs> like it just like brings you to the very end of the game. Which game? Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> just like no. get another iteration of the From Software game. Well, there is only one. <laughs> Wait, what happens if you beat the final boss at the beginning of Sekiro? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if it is. I just heard this story. Like, it just like takes you to the end of the game. <laughs> I thought it was just like fades to black, and it says. You lost off screen or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not something from software would do. They are really, really good at player choice. Um, yeah. They actually were an example of like choices well done in one of the videos. I think um, you lose to the boss you do. Yeah. I feel like there might be like a health bar cap and then it triggers, yeah. but yeah. Um did I fall in order? Uh, like you fight the second sister at the beginning, uh, and like you can get, I guess you can get like close to winning, but I don't think, like I think it always just puts you in a cutscene. Yeah, yeah, when you get like halfway through the water. Yeah, so, like I mean, you're you're obviously like really bad, so you might as well just die. But like if you can do something <laughs> and like try and win, it's just not gonna let you. Noticed a lot of games is just pacifist things. Oh, yeah. Noticed a lot in like uh, Dishonored, Undertale. That's really oh, yeah. Undertale that started that trend. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah. Undertale's a game known for its choice. I feel like we've done like a lot of bad choice examples. Let's I thought that's what we were supposed to be doing. I don't know. <laughs> we're just talking about choice in game in general, but yeah, like. <laughs> Oh, well, then Undertale, obviously. That's right, I'm that's the most mental. Apparently, Sekiro is in a non election where you kind of go to the final boss at the beginning. You get sniped by some guy off screen. Oh. <laughs> it's kind of funny, actually. I don't know if you can hear me, but any open world game. It, it absolutely is. Well, it's actually interesting because you can actually see the guy who snipes you in the cutscene. Either way. Hmm. So that's cool. So you know about him either way. Yeah. I guess they did that for like people who are replaying it because they do have a lot of replay value in Dark Souls and like from software games. So it's not like, oh, what the hell? I got sniped by this random asshole out of nowhere. It's like, oh, that guy, that's what he's for. I assume that's why they did that. Elden Ring is coming out soon. Less than 100 days. Wait, <laughs> Around a hundred days. Around a hundred words. I don't know. Yeah.
So we have one good example, and then <laughs> no, I'm gonna I call this Bethesda. <laughs> I mean, then there's, I guess, the choice of like sandbox games give you. Oh, yeah. Like sandbox all the sandbox games, games give you. Is about, this too far over for you guys? Can you read that? Just can Okay. I can see it, but I'm the closest person to it. So. Yeah, you don't count. <laughs> yeah, sandbox games are very much about making your own adventure. So they're all about choice. I play a lot of sandbox games. <laughs> about something like uh, I don't know if it's necessarily like about choice, but like Uncharted Four uh, and probably the other Uncharted games, like they're very linear. But I don't feel like I'm like when I played it, I played it like through like twice. I never felt like I was like just confined to one area. Like I could go around, but it was always just forward. I don't know. Yeah, that is kind of like the the gameplay thing that I was talking about earlier. And also, like games that just have a good sense of progression, they usually do have some illusions of choice in there too. Um, and they can help with like guiding the player forward. Because I mean, like if they're really compelled with the linear plot, then they're going to stick with the linear plot. And that's kind of a choice that they feel like they're making. Or it's like, oh, I could go off and do the side quests, but I really, really want to see how this ends, you know? I'm not sure if that's what Uncharted does. I've never played it. Uh, it's kind of just like, uh, it's not like open world. I just, I don't know. It's like level after level. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all story. Like there are no side missions. Like you can get collectibles or something like you find around the map, but it's kind of like, it tells you where to go. But I don't know. It's kind of just like, I don't know. I just when I played it, I didn't feel like I was like just being I guess being railroaded, but like because they were able to incorporate the uh you know just pushing me forward with it like easily, like oh maybe I you know I can't go this way because there was a rock slide or I don't know, I fell off. Um, yeah. I mean there's a lot of linear things out there that are completely in here and they're pretty good. I've played Half-Life Alex. Definitely enjoyed that. Pretty linear game though. Yeah, definitely. I do think game development companies are getting smarter about how to keep players on a linear path without it feeling like a linear path. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, you can go no further. There is no indication. You just can't. That is a bad thing. Don't do that. It's not working. It's wearing. Have you seen the video? What is it called? It's like I got my wife to play video games or something like that, where someone got their wife that has no video games experience into a bunch of video games. And at one of the points, she like ran into an invisible wall and didn't know what to do about it. And just like, like yeah, she kept going to the wall and it killed her. And then she kept doing it on repeat thing. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, game design. Yeah, linear walls and like just straight up kill zones that aren't like, you know, vertical, like, you know, you fell off the map and you get to yeah. the reset. Yeah, those genuinely generally <laughs> don't go over very well because for people who like don't have very high game literacy, they don't know what that means. So it's just like, oh, I must have gotten stuck on the architecture here. Or, oh, there must have been like this, this like fog thing that gave me an effect that I didn't realize. So yeah. Definitely give some indication that you can't go this way instead of just like, oh, you're dead now. You're dead. <laughs> Chrono Trigger is actually an incredible game for choice. One of the, there's the trial that you were talking about, that's actually uh, an illusion of choice. Because even if you make all the right choices and you're found innocent, the king still kicks you out. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that, those actually, those events happen pretty quickly. You do the stuff and then you have the trial like, right after. Um, one of the coolest things is that the final boss is available to be killed at like any point in the game. And depending on when in the game you kill the final boss, you get a different ending because of the things that you didn't do. Oh, that's really cool. That is and there's also a character. It, it's just like a normal like 2D JRPG. So the character set's pretty limited. But there's actually one character who's a boss. And at the end, you can decide whether to like spare them or kill them. 
And if you spare them, they join your party. And if you kill them, you just don't have them for the rest of the game. That changes dialogue and all kinds of stuff you have from your party for various events. That's cool. Like all those mean weapons that you hear, people like pop around the internet. Like the weapon that makes any enemy disappear, except for it doesn't actually kill them. It just makes them go to the final room. Oh, God. So you go to the final room, it just has all the enemy to use that weapon on. <laughs> That, that sounds, sounds like, mean and amazing, and <laughs> I would play that game. <laughs> so, so like, I, I don't know, I just hear like random weapon ideas that are memes, that are jokes that I see on the internet, and one of them was a weapon that just instantly makes any enemy disappear, but it doesn't actually kill the enemy, it just brings them to the final room. So you go to the final room and it's just all the enemies you use the weapon on. It sounds almost exactly like the warp and or stay away one from the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series, where they do almost exactly that. So you end up in the final room, which is the last room that you haven't checked, and all of the other bits that you didn't want to deal with before are just streaming out of it. <laughs> Uh, in a, have any of you guys ever played Risk of Rain 2? Oh, yes, I love that yeah, game. So good. Um, oh, the final boss, uh, Mythrix? Yeah, Mythrix. He has like multiple stages where it's like one is just you kill him, uh, then he like leaves, and then there's you know a bunch of just regular enemies, then he comes back down, and then he hit like uh, push down his like bar again, and then uh. And when that happens, he kind of goes back to the middle of the like area that you're fighting them, and he kind of just stays still for a minute or like 10 seconds, and you can't kill him then. But then he starts like taking all the items that you grabbed along the way, like going through each stage. It's like a roguelike game. Um, and then he uses them on you. So I guess it's like you can you have, I guess, like the choice of like getting all the items and be able to defeat them quickly, you know, and like all the enemies before that very quickly. But it's like when he takes them from you and you got nothing, then <laughs> you're dead meat. <laughs> yeah, that that happened to me my first run. I got like the one that makes all your attacks explode. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then he got that and hit me and I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember one time, like I, I thought I was doing really, really well. Uh, and I was on the last stage. Um, and like, he just, or I think I was on like the third stage of his boss fight. And he just like hits me really hard. I go flying. I still think I'm like playing though. And, but then I just realized, and then I hit the ground and I'm just like a ragdoll. I'm like, wait, what, what the hell happened? Like it was like after like 10 seconds. Yeah, the stage is also like super high up. It's like in the sky. Yeah. And if you die, it eats you like all the way down to the ground. <laughs> it's a good game. Y'all should play it. It's a really good game. It's very annoying. But... It can be annoying. What about the first one? Um, I don't know. I haven't played it. I'm pretty sure it's 2D. Yeah, it is 2D. And it's, it's pretty similar. Like, I don't know. I think they just kind of made it 3D and added some things. Like, I don't even know. I don't know what was added, uh, but like, I think the characters that you can play are the same. And there are definitely like similar enemies and probably stages, so, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the difference is just they ported it from 2D to 3D and like added some stuff. They probably not play the first one, just start with the second. Yeah, the second yeah. is really good. It's not like a story or it's not like a- like, Yeah, it's not story. a sequel, yeah. Yeah, cool. cool. Really choice, uh, I really like this Pizza Galactic, which is the best game ever. It's, it's on Stellar. It is on Stellar. Yeah. 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 We just released a huge update for it. Um, so, uh, really, uh, the terrain in it is completely destructible, which is pretty fun. So, unless you choose how you fight, you can either just fight in the open areas and just um, do your best, or you could create bunkers by digging into the terrain and uh, making a little house for yourself to defend, which is a lot easier. But, um, has a small chance of attracting, well, not attracting, but it could spawn an uh, enemy that can dig. It's really big. And so mm. if you're all inside of this tiny house and then you the alien just shows up and just, just rips, on it while that rolls you. <laughs> yeah, you just, your entire team gets speed rolled so fast when that happens. What was the name? Deep Rock. Deep Rock or Bebop? 
No, B ball. What's this? That boy B ball again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the door for. Yeah, that's the door for. Okay. I have a big memory of all of these. I haven't played it myself, but I've I seen love people it play. So much when the big alien shows up and everyone starts panicking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the house. Then there's that one guy who doesn't know what's going on. The house is safe, but he just gets friends. Oh, I also have to say this real quick. I'm going to play Risk of Rain 2 again. <laughs> like, it's just such a great game and it has a great uh, soundtrack to it. Like, if you like game soundtracks, like get risk just get risk of rain honestly yeah like, literally it's such a good soundtrack i do all of my homework listening to risk of rain and hades <laughs> who would win a fight deep rock or risk of rain in what in a fight <laughs> 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 the oh, music or the like the game start fighting Oh, so like the characters in the game? Or do you just mean like which one's better? Which game do you like? Like, which like am I throwing two discs at each other? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's probably Risk of Rain. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're different games. I yeah, know. they are. I, I'm going to say Risk of Rain. I haven't played both of them, so I don't know. Yeah, I haven't either. That's what makes this hard, Jess. So, yeah. I haven't played it. I'm, I'm just a big sandbox player. <laughs> Who the hell is calling me from Branson, Colorado? Oh, that's me. Sorry. <laughs> it says it's a scam call. So. Yeah. You don't feel like it. <laughs> that's me. I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Or that's good. There are a ton of examples. Oh, and print. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we did. And these are like, most of these are actually narrative choices, um, which is something that I always find really interesting is like people tend to latch onto the narratives of games, um, which is why I really like looking into them. But like at the same time, if you have like the best story in the world and your gameplay sucks, no one's going to play it, yeah. which is always something to keep in mind. There's one choice thing I'm thinking of that's not necessarily narrative. Um, it's like, and developers give the player a bunch of tools and like a physics engine and just tell them to solve problems however they can find out how to. Oh uh, yes, yeah, like, kind of like Breath of the Wild. Exactly, yeah, Breath of the Wild. People have come up with such crazy ways. Yeah, to literally just like, oh, like, like break the physics engine and make a flying machine and like <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah, I've seen some videos, I've seen some videos of like Breath of the Wild where this guy is like narrating what he's doing. He's like, I mean, I've never played it, but it's like, um, he just does all these like different moves on this one, like either like a rock or an enemy or something. And then like, he just does it so smoothly, like it's crazy. And then all of a sudden he just goes flying and he's already at like uh, <laughs> the uh, like volcano or whatever. Yeah, the, like, the speed running strats in that game are yeah, like off the yeah. wall. So funny, yeah. like, he just does it so smoothly. Like you can tell he's done it like a thousand times. Yeah. I think we're able to do that though. <laughs> figure that out. That's really crazy. crazy. Call this a physics sandbox. I guess you could also choose between like the uh, calculations, um, like in any game that has, I guess, weapons or anything, where it's like you can choose between going with like, you know, just guns, like assault rifle versus shotgun, you know. Depends on the map, depends on how you're feeling. Uh, uh, depends on your play style. Yeah, play style. Depends on visual design. And I say this totally as a dedicated Fashion Souls player. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does actually depend on design. Like, if a shotgun has a nice kickback, but you'd be a lot more likely to pick that. Yeah, literally. Good sound design. The, so. the game that I showed for the calculations, Warframe, that is the entire game. It's just like it's just you get weapons and there are like meta weapons um that like you know and that's sort of the calculation thing where like objectively they just have bigger numbers and they scale better which is like the whole thing with warframe is damage and, scaling but like game warframe is just making your character look good fashion frame, fashion frame <laughs> is the true end game though and that's what i was about to get to like i use some of like i use some old things from the old meta that's like 
outdated now and I just still use them because I fucking love shotguns and there are no meta shotguns <laughs> anymore. I would like bows and arrows even though they suck. If you're not using a <laughs> shotgun, if you're not using a shotgun in Operation Metro Battlefield 4, you are in one of them. Yeah, literally my favorite shotgun, it's like a legit pump action shotgun, which is the only pump action shotgun in the entire game where there's like a thousand fucking guns. <laughs> and the best part is the alternate fire, you shoot a rocket propelled grenade. <laughs> so it's my favorite gun and I'm never changing that. <laughs> yeah, definitely customization is also something that we could talk about yeah. that I did not talk about, but that is also like huge in player choice. That's more like illusions of choice, but like those are illusions of choice that players know they're making. So it's not really that. I'm not sure what you'd call that because they're making a choice, but it has no impact. So it's just a choice, not a meaningful choice, I guess is how we could say that. Yeah. We're going off calculations. It could even be a negative impact, but they're choosing it anyway. Yeah, because it's fun. Literally, yeah. there are some people I know in Warframe who take like the worst game games guns in the game there we go and they just see how far they can get just using that one weapon because they're like why not <laughs> and that's a choice they made yeah. i played planet side 2 a whole lot and they have this faction that's all blues and it's known as the shotgun faction why is everybody talking about planet side 2 on this <laughs> so, i don't know like i see someone on like discord like, i see like two different like unrelated discord wow. servers because they like, just announced that they're releasing a whole new content for it oh but then mm -hmm. like i don't know for whatever reason i'm sorry to interrupt like they just always like i always forget about the game and then it just finds some way to just pop up somewhere like <laughs> once every like three months i'm like oh yeah that game exists <laughs> all right back to just cause three that game is so old now yeah yeah it's uh it almost died for a while though but i'm glad it's getting a lot of new attention but yeah they have these uh shotgun people and each faction has its own like super class called a max and like the purple people have like a laser guy who has lasers for arms <laughs> and the red people have they have mini guns for arms and then uh the blue people of course have someone with shotguns for arms yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're the best yeah everyone loves them the best and they're the most populated faction but the shotgun max is statistically the worst because its effective range is nothing. <laughs> so yeah, it's a shotgun. <laughs> and yet it's the most chosen thing, even though it's the worst. So I think that's how do you even choose the shoot shotgun gun go blam like a game like that, where like the maps are just so incredibly big. Yeah. That, like you're never gonna like I could go like five minutes without even seeing someone and then I just quit the game because I only play for five. <laughs> yeah, like the maps there are massive and everyone just goes with the shotgun anyway, because like you said, they just like them. Even yeah. it's funny sometimes you'll find games it's that funny. have like like really unpopular classes or factions so the game developers just slowly make them more and more powerful so people pick them more and if you like find them find the obscure character that doesn't get picked then it's stupidly overpowered <laughs> because nobody picks them i don't know i've seen a few games that have done that <laughs> it's like well i wish more developers would do that <laughs> yeah it's just hilarious like, like this needs to be picked more so let's make it powerful until people start picking it yeah just <laughs> secretly buffing them yeah and then someone just picks it for fun and obliterates <laughs> everybody <Yeah. laughs> they completely destroyed that game for the fourth of july because they released a uh, special fourth of july weapon that was a crossbow <laughs> and they didn't good. play a pair test at all what which game planet said oh okay. they didn't player test this weapon at all even though they have a test server and it completely hmm. broke the game because you don't need to reload it at all. What? And it has just a giant bottomless clip. So if you stand on an ammo pack, you get infinite ammo. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can get explosive rounds for it. And someone oh. actually did uh, like crunch the numbers and it did more damage than a gunship in that game. <laughs> <laughs> and you can put on a flying character and just hover in the air and just destroy the battlefield. Oh my God. And, uh, that's when I stopped playing that. I haven't played it since. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that seems like one of the things that they'd have to fix. Though. Yeah, they patched that. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's always hilarious when they like put in stuff and don't think about it, and then they're like, "Oh my god, you guys took this and ran with it." <laughs> oh, I have another idea of choice. I think uh, in Ghost Recon. Um, good or bad? I'm gonna say good. All right. Uh, um. Uh, you know, I got space right here. 
Uh, in Ghost Recon, at least Wildlands, I think you can do it in the new one, uh, and maybe the old ones, I don't know. Uh, you could choose, like, how you approach a, um, I don't know what they, uh, what were they, um, I just don't, like, an outpost, I don't know, like, wherever the enemies were, um, like, you could either do it completely stealthily, uh, where it's, like, you know, put suppressors and, like, uh, I don't know. Uh, oh my God, I can't even think. Suppressors, uh, just do it silently, or just everything like that. Or you can go in guns place and like get a machine gun and just blow everybody up. And it's like you could choose what time you did. Like you could do it during the day, or you could do it at night and like maybe like you know kill the power. Or uh, what's it called? You can also like set uh, your AI like teammates or even just teammates like in co-op to uh, like do multi-kills so it's like if there are two people together and it's, if it were just you by yourself and you kill them then the other person is going to notice and then you're going to alert everybody but if you have two people shoot at once then they're both dead you're good and you can also like drag bodies away so people want to around. around yes yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah is that kind of like hitman where you have like a lot of different ways to accomplish yeah. the goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's not capitalized, and I don't care. Um, <coughs> what is Thanksgiving Day? Twenty so, seconds. So we have one more week of class, and then it's. We get the entire week back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's our fall break. I hope so. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, sucks for them. I'm not coming in that week. I'm flying back to California. Oh, cool. Cool. Well, I have run out of room on the board and it is 6.59. So I'd say this is as good a time as any to wrap it up.